Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Surprise Jab Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Ruger, surprising you with new topics every single week and jabbing you with your daily dose of UFC. But ladies and gentlemen, we have a surprise episode today. That's right, a surprise episode of the Surprise Jab Podcast. Who would have thought such a revolutionary idea like that could occur? But we are dropping our official March Madness bracket. That's right. We are going live here on the podcast together through all 63 games and predicting who we think will walk away victorious as well you know this is a spontaneous episode we're also going to be revisiting the first 10 wrestlemanias as as uh, some of you may know i am or i wouldn't say i'm now but i used to be a vivid wwe you know professional wrestling fan and i figured you know wrestlemania 40 the big 40s coming up i always watch the royal rumble wrestlemania that's like two of their biggest events they put on in january and uh, april and april 6 wrestlemania 40 goes down so i figured why not over the next few episodes revisit is it 1 through 10, 20 to 30, and 30 up to 39. So it's going to be fun today as well. But don't think that's, uh, don't think we're not going to talk about a little UFC today. We are going to go over the new updated UFC rankings following this past weekend's event, as well as update everyone on The Bachelor. So this is going to be a fun episode, dropping special time Thursday morning. I mean, who'd have thought that? So let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it because I'm absolutely pumped to talk about all of this stuff. So kicking us off. I mean, as always, we always got to kick off with a little UFC. I mean, who would we be if we didn't go over UFC stuff? I just don't think that just just wouldn't be the case. So Tuesday, March, gosh, what was that now? March 19th, UFC rankings updated following the weekend's events. Let's check out some changes that were made. Even though he didn't fight, Kyler Phillips went from 12 to 11 in the men's bantamweight division. Kyler Phillips, of course, coming off his huge win over Pedro Munoz. Dominic Cruz has not fought since 2020 when he uh, got brutally knocked out. 2022, I should say, when he got brutally knocked out by Marlon Vera. That was back in August of 2022. Um, I'll be interested to see what's next for both these guys. Kyler Phillips could be, could be poised for a fight with number nine ranked Rob Font. And as for Dominic Cruz, I don't know if Jose Aldo wins his fight against Jonathan Martinez. I think that would be an absolutely amazing fight to put on. Other than that, not too much else. Going to the heavyweight division, number eight ranked um, Tai Tuivasa is now ranked number 10 as Marcin Tiberia is now actually tied with Sergey Spivak for the number eight spot in the men's heavyweight division. Tai Tuivasa now riding a four fight losing streak. I don't really know what's next for Tai. It's kind of it's kind of tough to say. It's honestly it's honestly tough to say. There's not much good that comes out of a four fight losing streak. But I think you know someone like number 15th ranked Rodrigo Nascimento, number 14th ranked Rod- Marcos Rojo de Lima, even Derek Lewis fights like that. Jarzinho Rosenstruck will even throw out there fights like that to build them up. Anyone below him, I think you could fight. Don't give up all your hope on Bam Bam Tuivasa just yet. But as for Marcin Tabira, now ranked number eight. I mean, I don't really know if I'd want him to fight up. But, you know, he could be a pick-me-up fight for Halton Almeida. He could even fight Sergey Spivak, who's ranked number eight. You know, any other of the names I just listed. You know, sky's the limit for the options. But, like I said, nothing too exciting coming for both those guys. Women's bantamweight division, we have some movement. Catlin Vieira is now tied for the number two spot in the rankings with Myra Bueno Silva. No idea what either of those ladies are up to soon. But um, maybe the winner of Holly Holmes and Kayla Harrison could be next for Catlin Vieira. Macy Chasson following her round one submission over Pan Gianza is now ranked number six in the women's bantamweight division. I like a fight with number four ranked Irene Aldana for her, or even better yet, number two ranked Myra Bueno Silva. Those would be a fun fight. Misha Tate's up to seven and Carol Rosa's up to eight as Pan Gianza drops down to the number nine spot in the rankings. And thank goodness, number 10 ranked Yana Santos, who had previously been ranked number seven, finally falls down to 10. She hasn't fought in since July of last year, where she lost, and she hasn't won a fight since, I'm pretty sure, 2021. It's been a while. Chelsea Chandler following her win over Jose and Nunez just d- d- jumps over her in the rankings from 14 to 13. Jose and Nunez now ranked 14. Chelsea Chandler, you know, it's, it's tough to say she could take on number 10 ranked Yana Santos we just talked about. Jose and Nunez could take on... I don't know, number 12 ranked Julia Vila. I, I really don't know. One's been It's kind of a dead division. We need Kayla Harrison to come in and revive it. She'll be fighting on UFC 300, making her debut in the UFC. How exciting. Yeah, not too many, not too many um, rankings changes as of late. And ladies and gentlemen, it does not get better. It does not get better. It actually gets worse as next weekend, the only ranked fighters we have is the number seven ranked Amanda Hebus in the women's strawweight division. 
And is Rose Namajunas even ranked? Um, no, Rose Namajunas isn't even ranked, Rose. So it's just you get number number seven ranked Amanda Hebas in the women's strawweight division. And she's actually going up in weight to women's flyweight to take on Rose Namajunas. So it is it is not pretty. It is not pretty at all. Oh, Amanda Hebas is also ranked number eight in women's flyweight. So I guess you have that. Um, but if Justin Taffa does knock out Carl Williams, I would rank him at number 15 in the men's heavyweight division. That, that's something I would do. He'll, he'll be in the co-main event. And, of course, on uh, tomorrow's episode or Friday, whenever you listen to this, we'll be going over all the fights for UFC Vegas. Not, uh, 89, 89. Wow, we're almost at 100. UFC Vegas 100. They should do something big for that, being that it's in the apex. But, yeah, this is the upcoming weekend's card. Not too much to be excited about. But, uh, you know what? I can get everyone juiced. I can get everyone excited about a little UFC. UFC. Don't sleep on my UFC abilities to get everyone psyched about it. But of course, we're building up for UFC 300. So in the meantime, we just kind of dilly dally here and there. So that's all our UFC for this episode. Let's keep it moving to the latest Bachelor episode dropped this past Monday. I was able to watch it live. Thank you, YouTube TV. Absolutely amazing. Love you, Grandpa. Of course, coming through with the plug on the YouTube TV, which is basically cable TV. Might as well put that out there. It's basically cable TV. And uh, this was the woman's tell-all, and of course, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, if I have any Bachelor fans were like, oh, I didn't get to see the episode, what, what, what happened? But no, it was the woman's tell-all, which means all the women just stood, just came on show and talked about everything. And we also found out what um, Kelsey's note was that she left for Joey, and quite honestly, it was the dumbest thing ever. It's actually turned me against Kelsey, as it basically said, um, you know, she obviously wrote him a note and said, we need to talk. She goes to his room to talk. Joey's about to cry. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm such an insecure little boy. And Kelsey's like, I just, uh, I just missed you. I can't stop thinking about you. And uh, yeah, and it was so dumb, so dumb. We get to the rose ceremony. Obviously, Rachel's kicked off. Obviously, Rachel's kicked off. She broke her freaking jaw jumping into the into that little remote pond or whatever in the jungle. So uh, Rachel's gone. Rachel's gone. I hear people saying, "Oh, Rachel should be the next Bachelor." No, she's got no personality. Seems like a nice girl, but uh, yeah, she never stood a prayer. So your final two women are Daisy, of course, Daisy uh, Kent. Is that her last name? I can't even remember. Uh, she is from uh, Becker, Minnesota. I've actually delivered stuff there this summer when I worked at a place for the contractors. I delivered some uh, roofing supplies to Becker, Minnesota. Not too bad of a town, but yeah, I'll be rooting for Daisy just because she's from Minnesota, but other than that, I can honestly care less. Kelsey's just so, like, lovey-dovey over Joey. It's like, like, Joey's just her lifeline, so it kind of makes me cringe, but, uh, you know, I've been hearing word from people that uh, apparently, you know, he might not end up with either lady on The Bachelor. They both might say no to him in the finale, which goes down this upcoming Monday, March 25th. Excited to see how that all ends, but the woman tell all... Didn't really miss anything. Um, what's her face? Maria came on, was obviously the star, obviously has a fan base now. She should definitely be the next Bachelorette, without a doubt, unless they do Bachelor in Paradise or something like that, whatever. But she was so fun watching her just bicker with everyone. But then she made up with all the girls that she was beefing with. It was very odd. You know, all the women were like, I just want to be friends. I wish we could have been friends. And they all hugged and kissed and made up. And you're like, oh, boo, we want the drama. Want the drama. But they are honestly, they were all so insufferable. They are all so boring. Um, should have kept Jen on. He honestly should have kept Jen on. I feel like Jen was better than Rachel, and he might have had better of a connection with her. Actually, Maria should have been on. Maria, Jen, Kelsey, and Daisy. And honestly, I wouldn't have Kelsey. I wouldn't honestly have Kelsey if I was Joey. I'd have gone with Maria. She was more his speed. They had to, they seem to have more human like conversations. I feel like he's just so like scripted with Kelsey and sometimes Daisy even. It's honestly so so random. But the Bachelor's coming to an end soon. Um, my official prediction: probably going Daisy. Probably going Daisy. You know, obviously don't know what's gonna happen. But I definitely think that if he were to choose him and Daisy, could actually work out better because she wants to take things slow. She doesn't want to get married. Once the show's over, she's realistic. She wants to date afterwards. Um, and as for Kelsey, you know, she's just too obsessed with him. Too obsessed with him. There's just something about, you know, a woman like that where they're just like, oh my gosh, if I don't have, if I don't see Joey, I'm going to lose my mind. She was having a panic attack because she was, he was on a date with a different girl, which I guess under different circumstances would be warranted. Like, okay, hey, my boyfriend is hanging out with another girl without me going on a date. That's a red flag. But when you're on The Bachelor, you know, you know what the, the, the stakes are when you're on the bachelor okay it's it's a completely different ballpark so we'll leave the bachelor in the past and we'll look forward to other bachelor episodes or who knows what else could come 
But yes, now on to my, our fun part, which I've been looking forward to for a while now, and that is WrestleMania. I mean, I've just been jonesing, ready to go over all these events. They've been they've been going on for quite some time. So let me just give basically a background. WrestleMania is the Super Bowl of professional wrestling. It's the NBA Finals. It's the finale of your show. It's the March Madness of college world, you know, it's the, the Rose Bowl, and I don't even know, whatever example, but it is a massive, massive deal, and, it, and oddly enough, professional wrestling has more fans than I'm pretty sure any other sports league, because it's global, it targets kids, it's not for people who even like sports, it's like for people who kind of like heroes and action and plots, it is global, it is massive, and this whole idea of WrestleMania came about in March of 1985, when the first WrestleMania went down at Madison Square Garden. In, where over 19,000 people attended absolutely crazy. Vince McMahon came up with it with uh, Jim Crockett, um, Vince McMahon, legendary owner of all of it. Of course, there's storylines for all these, but just for the first WrestleMania, it was all fun. It was all about the spectacle. There were nine matches on there. So to start off with WrestleMania 1, what were some of the biggest moments that went down there? Well, you had some... I had some notable uh, notable fighters on there. You had uh, King Kong Bundy, giant man over 300 pounds. You had Ricky Steamboat on here. Um, Brutus Beefcake. You had David San Martino, son of the great um, Bruno San Martino. Uh, Junkyard Dog defeating Greg Valentine. The Iron Sheik and Nikola Volkov. Um, but probably the two most notable, notable fights on here was Andre the Giant defeating Big John Studd in a career versus $15,000 body slam challenge. Very odd match. Match, but very notable when it comes to Big John Studd because he, of course, won the Royal Rumble that year and was rewarded with uh, fighting, let's just say, Andre Giant, or maybe someone else won. I honestly cannot remember my WWE history, but the main event, it was the big shebang, Hulk Hogan, that's right, the great Hulk Hogan, and Mr. T, that's right, Mr. T from freaking um, Rocky. Um, they defeated Paul Orndorff and Roddy Piper. Roddy, Roddy Piper. Rest in peace. Um, Muhammad Ali and Pat Patterson were the special guest referees. And fun fact, the longest match on this card was 13 and a half minutes, which was the main event. Other than that, the next four before that were under seven, under six minutes. And you even had King Kong Bundy defeating Special Delivery Jones in 25 seconds. It's just crazy to see how... Quickly, how quickly times have changed in the last uh, decades, you will say, just in regards to professional wrestling. Because just how wrestling works, the whole, the, how you perform in the ring, like it's much more technical now. Back then it was all about big names, big slams, stuff like that. Loads of fun, but that's what we had for WrestleMania. The original, the original WrestleMania. Then we get into WrestleMania 2, which went down in 1986. And this one was um, took place in three different places. It took place in Uniondale, New York, at the Nassau Coliseum, uh, Coliseum where uh, 16,500 fans watched that. It also took place in Rosemont, Illinois, at the Rosemont Horizon Center. 9,000 people watched that. And the big finale at the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena in California, where 14,500 people watched it. And this was, this was kind of like the WWE. WWE or the WWF at the time, World Wrestling Federation, now it's worldwide, or World Wrestling Entertainment, they basically said like, hey, WrestleMania is a thing to last, you know, we're going to turn it into this thing, it's sort of like the Super Bowl, you had your original Super Bowl, and once Super Bowl 2 kicked around, you realized, okay, this is going to be here to stay, and there's tons of celebrities involved with this, by the way, they were all about their celebrities, um, Ray Charles sang America the Beautiful. I mean, the great Ray Charles, amazing voice. You had Daryl Dawkins, former NBA player there. Joan Rivers, notable actress. Joe Frazier, the athlete. You had freaking Dick Butkus, Ed Jones, Ozzy Osbourne. Okay, my goodness, so many celebrities going down here. Of course, let's get into this match card. Of course, we were in Chicago, New York, California, all the big spots. And it was headlined in a steel cage match by Hulk Hogan versus King Bundy. And that's technically regarded as the official WrestleMania 2 main event. But when you look at the fact it was at three different venues, you have to understand that every venue had four matches and each venue had a main event. So if we go to officially what was the first card, this was essentially three cards. It's a very weird concept to even say out loud because they've never done this again because of how hectic it was. But 
We kicked it off at the Nassau Coliseum in New York. You had Paul Orndorff on there, legendary wrestler, amazing. You also had Randy Savage, that's right, Macho Man in the uh, first Spider-Man movie. He defeated George Steele for the Intercontinental Championship. You even had Jake the Snake Roberts taking on George Wells. George Wells, very odd wrestler. He used to rip open the turnbuckle with his teeth and just eat like the stuff inside. Very weird. Rest in peace to Jake the Snake Roberts. I, did Jake pass? I think he has, but if he hasn't, I'm sorry. Mr. T with Joe Fr- Frazier defeated Roddy Piper with Lou Duval by a disqualifi- disqualification in a boxing match. Obviously scripted, everything scripted. You can basically think of professional wrestling as stunt actors doing their work. They get hurt, they get hit, but of course like they, they're they given a script and they're just told to ride with it. So kicked us off in New York, not too bad. We go to the Rosemont Horizon Center in uh, Chicago, as I said, and you had Andre the Giant winning a WWF versus NFL battle royal very uh very very fun you had jim brunzel tony atlas pedro morales harvey martin ted arcidi danny speed i mean you had so many so many players from all the teams william refrigerator perry was in this absolutely crazy you even had uh russ francis from the san francisco 49ers on here Main event, if you will, for this card. You had the British Bulldogs with Lou Albano and Ozzy Osbourne in their corner, defeating the dream team of Greg Valentine and Bruce Beefcake with Johnny Valiant in their corner for the WWF Tag Team Championships. And as you can kind of see, there's a theme here of basically the first three matches lasting under six minutes, and then you get to the main event, and it's around 13 minutes. We kicked off the end of WrestleMania 2 at the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena where you had Ricky Steamboat getting a win. You had uh, Terry Funk getting a win over the Junkyard Dog. Fun matchup. And the main event, a steel cage match for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship where Hulk Hogan defeated King Kong Bundy. Beat him off the side of the cage. Absolutely crazy moment. And the cage was uh, blue. Very rare you see that. WrestleMania 2. Did it triumph its original? I think so. I think, you know, if you kind of follow a pattern, WrestleManias get better with every single, you know, stance, if you will. But... Like I said, this was back in the 80s. This was fresh. This was new. We were still learning what we were dealing with at the time. We get into WrestleMania 3, which went down in 1987 in Pontiac, Michigan. And it went down at the Silver Dome where 78,000 people watched Hulk Hogan take on Andre the Giant. And WrestleMania 3 triumphs its predecessors, especially in the main event. It was much more entertaining. Definitely captured the crowd much more. Plus, it had the biggest, biggest attendance of its time with 78,000. Thousand. I mean, you know, that's a Super Bowl type number. That's absolutely crazy. I mean, this was just took over. There were twelve matches, most in most in like a straight straight like order for a uh, WrestleMania card at the time. Most notable fights on here. I mean, you had Harley Race defeating the Junkyard Dog. Both notable notable uh, wrestlers. Roddy Rye Piper fighting on here in a hair versus hair match against Adrian Don. It's just the most random stuff they did. You had the Hart Foundation, of course. Bret Hart, Jim Neihart, Jimmy Hart. No, the Hart fa- the Hart family. One of the most notable wrestling families of all time. They actually have a. Or if they used to have it, I don't know if they still have it now, but a gym where they like taught you how to wrestle. Of course, wrestling takes skill. You know, it's it's like uh, acting, if you will. You have to learn how to properly do it. You also had Ricky Steamboat defeating Randy Savage for the Intercontinental Championship in what was one of the greatest matches up until that point. Took 14 and a half minutes. The longest WrestleMania match of that time, 14 and a half minutes. You also had the Iron Sheik and Nikola Volkov defeating the Killer Bees. What a fun name. And we get to the main event, which is all WrestleMania 3 is really remembered for, as Hulk Hogan defeated Andre the Giant, becoming the first man, you know, quotations, to pick him up and slam him, which was an incredible feat as Andre Giant, I'm pretty sure, was over 400 pounds tall, almost 7 foot, picking on him up, slamming him down, dropping his signature leg drop, and retaining the WWF World Heavyweight Championship. Such a such an iconic WrestleMania moment. Gotta be in the top 10, top 25, if you will, WrestleMania moments of all time up until this point. Hulk Hogan, just an icon of the time. But as you'll notice, Hulk Hogan continues to main event WrestleManias until eventually reaches a point where the fans just get sick of him. But next year, we headed to uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey at the historic Atlantic City Convention Hall, where 18,165 people watched WrestleMania 4. And fun fact, WrestleMania 5, the one we're going to talk about right after, was actually held at the same location. This, of course, went down in 1988. It was actually advertised um, as Trump Plaza Boardwalk Hall. Very fun spot. Storylines heading into this, um, it was originally Andre the Giant versus Hulk Hogan 2. 
um, was going to be the main event, but um, uh, Hogan's on-screen friend, um, Andre the Giant, of course, um, I'm trying to see if I can get anything off here, um, I think something happened uh, where, like, it, like, didn't end up being the main event, I don't know, I can't find it, but the card itself, that's pretty much what I'm gonna be primarily talking about, we had, uh, so 16, 16 matchups on this card, I believe it's one of the longest WrestleManias up until this point, and actually of all time, and they decided it was a good idea to have a 16-man tournament for a shot at the WWF World Heavyweight Championship, which ended up not working out, whatsoever um you had the great ted dibiase of course like money man he won a matchup on here you had greg valentine randy savage all winning jake roberts and rick rude had a uh, first round tournament match that ended in a draw you had their your first glance at the ultimate warrior who would come to main event wrestlemania one day and Hulk Hogan was not in the main event as he had a, a quarterfinal match against Andre Giant, which ended in double disqualification. I think Hulk Hogan was dealing with something. There's definitely a reason he wasn't the main event. They wouldn't just not have him be the main event. But, um, you know, eventually we get down in the tournament, you know, get down to the very end. And Randy Savage defeats Ted DiBiase to win the belt. And I think it actually ended with Randy Savage uh, being helped by Hulk Hogan. So they just couldn't help but squeeze Hulk Hogan in there. But, I mean... None of these matches really lasted long. The longest was a 15-minute, which um, it was supposed to go. It was like up until 15 minutes because it went the distance. Very, very odd. WrestleMania 4, very forgetful. Not one of the better ones. But we get to WrestleMania 5, which went down in 1989, also going down in New Jersey. And this one was headlined as the Mega Powers, as they were called at the time. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan exploded in a feud and resulted in them being in the main event, which was one of the best WrestleMania, like, you know, hype moments at the time, if you will. Also on the card, I mean, nothing really too notable. You had the Hart Foundation, they were back. You had some young wrestlers like, uh, I believe it was Owen Hart, uh, Shawn Michaels making their names under different names like the Red Rooster. Uh, Jake Roberts and Andre the Giant by disqualification. I actually think he put a snake on him or something, but all WrestleMania 5 is remembered for is that main event, which ended up being the longest WrestleMania match up until that point at almost 18 minutes when Hulk Hogan defeated Randy Savage in what was a very competitive bout. Very fun, very good. Both of the most legendary wrestlers of all time. Rest in peace to Randy Savage. But like I said, these early WrestleMania is not that good. We get into WrestleMania 6, though, where this the moments here, the moments here were legendary. Going down on April 1st in 1990 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada at the Sky Dome, almost 68,000 fans watched Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior. Absolutely amazing moment. And fun fact, legendary wrestler, former WWE champion, one of the greats of all time, Edge, was actually in attendance. Him and Christian were actually in attendance. Um, as were uh, notable wrestlers Lance Storm, Renee Packett, uh, actor Stephen Emile. Uh, very fun stuff. You know, all these guys, and they were all young. They were just going there to watch it because it was just such a spectacle, such a captivating thing of the times. Um, this event actually received mixed to positive reviews because most reviewers praised the main event. Um, but you know, the rest of the card they said was just kind of, just kind of average, just kind of average. Nothing, nothing too exciting going down here. 15 matches on the card. Of course, the main event, Ultimate Warrior defeating Hulk Hogan in a 25 minute match where Ultimate Warrior would actually win the, uh, Intercontinental Championship and the WWF Championship. I believe that he became like one of the first people to actually beat Hulk Hogan by pinfall. Pretty, pretty incredible moment. Pretty fun, but these early WrestleManias, they were just headlined by Hulk Hogan, creating big moments with another guy. Um, you had Dusty Rhodes on here, defeating Randy Savage. Rest in peace to both of those men. You had the Orient Express, defeating the Rockers. The young Shawn Michaels on there. Ted DiBiase, defeating Jake Roberts. You had Big Boss Man, Rick Rude. A lot of notable names for any of my wrestling fans, but like I said, nothing too much here. Just the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan giving us the best moment of that time. Definitely of that WrestleMania. That's for certain. And WrestleMania 7 is where we started to kind of get sick of seeing uh, Hulk Hogan. I've actually watched this main event here. WrestleMania 7, which went down in Los Angeles, California, at the Memorial Sports Arena, where almost 16,000 people watched Sergeant Slaughter take on Hulk Hogan. Uh, Hulk Hogan, of course, winning the WWF Championship in the main event, but this is just an absolute disaster. Hulk Hogan versus Sergeant Slaughter, one of the most boring wrestling matches I've ever watched. It's 20 minutes long, and it is just so dull, so boring. The crowd is not into it, and this is honestly a very forgetful 
WrestleMania. This will actually be the final WrestleMania appearance for Andre the Giant, as he would unfortunately pass away in 1993. So rest in peace to the great Andre the Giant. He was actually in attendance here. But um, you had Coco Beware on here, the Rockers, you had the British Bulldog, Jake Roberts, the Undertaker. Making his first appearance, Undertaker, one of the greats on the Mount Rushmore of wrestling, where he defeated Jimmy Snuka in four minutes and 20 seconds, if you will. Um, Ultimate Warrior defeated Randy Savage in a 20-minute bout. That was one of the better, better moments of this card. But yeah, WrestleMania 7, very forgetful. But you did see a debuting Undertaker, Hulk Hogan win again, and the Ultimate Warrior picking up a win. And into WrestleMania 8 in 1992, going out the Hooser Dome in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. They they had almost 63,000 fans here, 62,167. This was um this is a very odd one. This was a very odd one as it was kind of shown that it was supposed to be Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan as the main event, but they kind of did a last minute switch and you ended up seeing Hulk Hogan take on Sid Justice in a impromptu main event when it really shouldn't have been. Um if anything it should have been Where's it at? Randy Savage and Ric Flair should have been the main event. Just an absolute disaster booking-wise. Randy Savage and Ric Flair put on an amazing 18-minute match. Excellent action. You even had The Undertaker on here defeating Jake Roberts. They are keeping to build him up. Shawn Michaels won a match on over Tito Santana on here. But just another forgettable one. Just another forgettable one. You had Hulk Hogan in the main event winning by disqualification. Just so boring. Just zero interest in this. And Hulk Hogan was just wearing himself out doing all of these all of these wrestling matches. And everyone was kind of just like, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with Hulk Hogan. So that's when we get to WrestleMania 9 where officially it boiled over. It officially boiled over at WrestleMania 9 when it came to this Hulk Hogan era. It went going down in 1993 in Paradise, Nevada at Caesars Palace. Almost 17,000 fans attended this, and this was built around two main storylines. The first was the unstoppable Yokozuna, who... If you like acting, if you like acting, if you also like cultural appropriation, you had a Samoan acting like he was a Japanese, um, uh, what, what, what do they call it, um, sumo wrestler in Yokozuna. Actually, he was either the father or uncle of the Usos, who are absolutely taking over wrestling nowadays. He was challenging Bret Hart, one of the greats for the WWF Championship, in the main event. And the other major storyline was the return of Hulk Hogan, who had departed after last year's WrestleMania, but had returned this year, so... Very fun stuff. Um, you know, of course, WrestleMania still considered the WWF's main um, attraction. Gained so much attention. So many so many celebrities. So much fun stuff going down at this WrestleMania. And this one was very ballsy as it was held outside. It was held outside. Um, very odd choice at the time. Uh, having events outside is always risky. They didn't really run into too many delays at the time. But, um, you know, let's just get into this card. Ten fights on this wrestling event. You had, um, uh, of course, Undertaker in one of his worst matches ever against Giant Gonzalez. Giant Gonzalez, by the way, did not really know how to actually wrestle. It was very embarrassing. Not the best performance. Definitely regarded as one of the lesser moments. Some of the best matches on here. Lex Luger defeating Mr. Perfect. That's probably the best wrestling you're going to see on this card. Razor Ramon and Bob Backlund was kind of silly. Tatanka and Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental Championship was definitely giving us something fun there. But we get into what originally was the main event, Yokozuna versus Bret Hart, where uh, Yokozuna beats Bret Hart, the champion, to win the WWF Championship. A great moment, the, the you know, but the, for some reason, for some reason, wrestling was not really sold on having the bad guy win to end a night. Nowadays it is. Nowadays you can have the bad guy win, but Yokozuna beating Bret Hart, you know, just under a nine-minute match because Yokozuna was a big boy, couldn't move around that much, and they then elected last minute after, by the way, Yokozuna becoming the champion, beating Bret Hart, who had held the belt for over 500 days now, they elected to then have Hulk Hogan run down who had a black eye for some reason, challenged Yokozuna, hit him with one leg drop, beat him in 22 seconds. It was an absolute disaster. And yeah, the fans were going crazy, but looking back, it was an absolute disaster. And this was kind of the end of the Hulk Hogan era, if you will. The end of the Hulk Hogan era. No one was really having it anymore. And I honestly should end it there. But, you know, I'm just going to kind of do this in increments as I go. So as we go to WrestleMania 10... 
legendary matches here going down in New York City at Madison Square Garden. 19,444 people in the uh, in attendance at this card. And basically, the WWF decided we're going to rewrite the wrongs of last year. We are going to deliver a banger, a banger card on here. I mean, you even had Burt Reynolds make an appearance as a guest ring announcer for the main event. Absolutely and crazy. Um, you know, of the 18,065 people who went, they paid out a total of 960000 in admission fees, which was absolutely crazy if you have to go back to the 90s to see that much money being thrown out for an event. And we, this was a 10-match 10, 10 card, um, some of the better matches. We kick off the night, Owen Hart and Bret Hart, relatives, some of the best wrestling you'll see. They're so technical, Bret Hart and Owen Hart. They know how to do the slams. They know how to go under each other. Um, they know how to drop the elbows, give... give Give the, um, I'm trying to think, the, the drop kicks, if you will. Amazing wrestling, amazing technicality, and it really got WrestleMania going here. It felt like WrestleMania. We get into one of my favorite, one of my favorite matches of all time. This is one of the greatest wrestling matches of all time. It's a five-star match. Razor Ramon defeating Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental Championship in a ladder match. It has some legendary moments. Shawn Michaels diving off. Razor Ramon falling off the top of the ladder. Such a good match. Best of the card by far. But in the main event, they decide, you know what? We had Yokozuna win last year. We had Hulk Hogan run out. We're going to redo that. So with Roddy Roddy Piper as a guest referee, Bret Hart defeated Yokozuna, who, by the way, was now your WWF champion, to win the belt. Bret Hart gets his WrestleMania main event, wins the belt, but night was overshadowed by Razor Ramon defeating Shawn Michaels. And even weirder, Yokozuna had won the belt on this card. It was a very weird, very weird card. Um, he also had Randy Savage, one of his uh, one of his better matches over Crush. I don't even know who that is, if I'm being honest. Bam Bam Bigelow was on here, but... Yeah, we're going to leave WrestleMania 1 through 10 to the past. Definitely going to leave it to the past. Um, we got better ones to come. Don't think we don't have better ones to come. I mean, they just pick up from 11 to 20, 20 to 30. You start to see more, and they've just they've gotten better and better, more exciting, more big. And it's all going to build up on April 6th and 7th when we go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for the Lincoln Financial Field for the main event. And by the way, since... 20, what is it now? 2020, I think it is. They've now done double main events where WrestleMania is on a Saturday and a Sunday. They've never really done that before. That never really been a thought for them to do that before, but I like the idea. It gains more attention, oddly. So, going to be fun to talk about that as we will be dropping our WrestleMania 40 predictions. I understand it's scripted, but it's not like they leaked the scripts. You can kind of make accurate guesses, but this is what it is. Good times. And uh, the wrestling realm. But uh, yeah, we'll be back next episode with 11 through 20. If anyone finds that interesting, you know, let me know. I know a lot about WWE. I know some of my buddies that know stuff about WWE. It's always fun. Talk about some of your hobbies that some people might not know too much about. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the final thing for this surprise episode of the Surprise Show Podcast. That's right. We're going to be crafting our official March Madness bracket. I've made so many. I've looked at all the stats. I've picked so many upsets, gone with the favorites, decided who I want. And I think I've elected on who I think is going to win the 2024 the the March Madness bracket. So let's get right on into this and make our prediction because we have 63 games to predict. Are you kidding me? Come on, let's get right at it. So of course, if no one knows, we've been watching the play-in games as of late. And we already saw that yesterday, Colorado State and who was the 16th seed for us? I can't even remember. Wagner both got their wins. We just watched Grambling State, I believe it was, win earlier today. And as of right now, Boise State will be playing Colorado to see who makes it. And I don't really know if those are going to be too big of implications. But, of course, all games for the rounds of 32 and 64 all go down. This got coming Thursday and Friday and then Saturday and Sunday. Following weekend, you get your Sweet 16 Elite Eight matchups. Following weekend is your final four. So let's let's just get right into it because we got a lot of stuff to get through. We kick things off with UConn and Stetson. UConn, obviously the number one team in the tournament. Last year's winners, they went 31-3. 
31 and 3 this year. Absolutely crazy. They take on 16 seeded Stetson. And honestly, don't know too much about Stetson, but I'll tell you what. If there was ever a 16 seed I didn't think was going, it was Stetson. UConn should be a lock to move on to the second round of the tournament. But here's what things get more interesting. We get into our eight and nine seed matchups. And this is where I kind of find it fascinating on who I'm going to go with. So we obviously have FAU, Florida Atlantic University, taking on Northwestern. Florida Atlantic went 25 and 8 on the leader on the year, led by Janal. Davis, who averaged 18.2 points per game. Ashton Northwestern, they had Boo Booey, who averaged 19.2 points per game. Florida Atlantic, they had a couple close games this season. Wins over Arizona, close loss to Illinois, went over Texas A&M, but... I don't know. Northwestern just isn't really giving me anything to make me want to pick them. I mean, so, and then just FAU, this is a pretty similar team to the team that made it to the final four last year. Give me Florida Atlantic. Moving on, you have another team from the final four last year of San Diego State. Absolutely crazy. They put all three of last year's, um, or three of four of last year's final four teams in the same seeded bracket who could all be playing at close to Sweet 16, but uh, San Diego State, your 5 seed, matches up with 12 seed UAB. If I'm not mistaken, UAB won their conference to get into this tournament. I don't even know what conference they're in, but a uh, fun fact, by the way, at least one number 12 seed has defeated a number 5 seed in 32 of 38 tournaments. Three of the six times 12 seeds failed to win a first-round game have occurred in the past eight Attorneys, including last year where no number 12 seed won. And this San Diego State team, which made it to the championship last year, brought back a notable amount of their players from last year. Not all of them, but a few. I think San Diego State gets past UAB. I don't even know where UBA is. University of Alabama, Birmingham. That might actually be it. I don't know. Next matchup on our cards, Auburn takes on Yale. Yale won, if I'm not mistaken, the Ivy League to get into the tournament, but I mean, there's just, there's nothing impressive from this team, I mean, but Ivy League teams do historically give opponents trouble, but I mean, Auburn is just too freaking good, if I'm being honest, they've played teams close all year, Bruce Pearl, head coach, his team has just done so well, they lead both both sides of the ball, offense and defense, they've been equally good, um, they rank top 15 in defensive three-point field goal percentage, which is what um, Yale really uh, excels in his three-point percentage. Um, when we look at their uh, opponent's points per game, Yale does give up less points, but Auburn scores 8.1 more points than Yale per game. I think that's really going to play an impact. Give me Auburn. Auburn's a team I could see going far in the tournament and for our bracket. There's no upsets yet. Give me Auburn. Here's where things get interesting. Here's where things get interesting because you have BYU, that is right, Birmingham Young, the Cougars, taking on the Duquesne Dukes. Duquesne won their conference tournament to get into here, um, the Atlantic 10, that is. They've now extended their win streak to eight games. You really can't enter March Madness with more momentum than that. Their last loss came on February of uh, the last, February 23rd, to be more specific. And that February loss... If I'm not mistaken, it was to a good team. I think it was to Dayton. Might have been to Dayton. I don't know, but this team's been on absolute fire. But BYU, there's just something about this team that just makes me want to ride with them. I don't know what it is. I know it's because I pick so many upsets usually, and they don't hit. But they have star players in Jackson Robinson and Fuzni Travor, who are both so, so talented. And I, th- I just feel like they've played tougher people. I mean, they played Nebraska and Dayton, who are both in the tourney. But then again, then again, they 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 played VCU, who Duquesne beat to win. Um, it's very it's very tough, very tough. Oh, I was looking at Duquesne. BYU has played much tougher competition. That's what I'm looking for. Baylor, Iowa State, Houston, Kansas, TCU, Texas Tech. That's what I'm looking for. And you know, the last time number six seeds won all four meetings with number 11 seeds in a single tournament was 2004. Obviously, I'm picking a lot of 11 seeds in this tournament, so give me BYU for this round one matchup. Now we get into a fun one, Illinois, Moorhead State. I watched Illinois win the Big Ten tournament. I know how good they are, but don't, don't forget about Moorhead State. They also went 26-8 and eight on the year, same record as Illinois. Commission doing a great job mixing them up. Does it even say what um, division they're in or conference? 
conference. I meant to say the Ohio Valley Conference. Um, the player of the year is actually on this team, led the league, or led the conference, I should say, Riley Minix with 20.8 points per game. You also have Jordan Lathan on this team. This could be a sneaky good team, but I mean, this could be an upset. It could very much happen. But I'm not picking against Illinois. Illinois is so freaking good. They just looked amazing this year. And this is a team that I could easily see sneaking their way to the Sweet 16. But at the same time, Illinois, uh, those eight losses, they weren't necessarily pretty. I mean, they lost to Tennessee, to Purdue, Michigan State. Um, again, they did play some games close. I'm riding with Illinois. They won the Big Ten. They got the momentum. Let's keep it rolling. Plus, my family's from Illinois, and I've heard that when you're making predictions for the tournament, you have to kind of take personal life into account. Here we go. My first and favorite upset is the number 10 Drake over the number 7 Washington State. And obviously, I've just been seeing it everywhere. Drake won their conference to get here. They hold wins over Nevada. They hold wins over, I don't even say what else, but the Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year is on this team. That is the conference they were in. Tucker DeFries, who's averaging 21.8 points per game. Dude is an absolute killer in the paint. We need these upsets, and I think I just want to set up an Iowa-Iowa matchup as Drake is in Iowa. Washington State, I know that maybe I should, you know, not so much as sleep on you as much as I am now, but there's just, there's just nothing from Washington State that's really, you know, bringing me in. So we'll ride with Drake, our first upset of the tournament. And on average, there are 13 upsets in March Madness on average per bracket. So if we average that out, we're looking to get about 14 to 12. In fact, I'm looking more in that 13, 14, 15 range for upsets, more upsets than less. So this is our first of many. First two seed 15 matchup, Iowa State, South Dakota State. If there's ever going to be a team that was going to upset, it's South Dakota State. I actually think I know people that go there. I think my buddy Matthew is in a frat there at South Dakota. But um, Iowa State, you know, props to them. They won, um, they won their conference. They beat, um, they blew out Houston 69-41 to to win whatever conference they're in. I'm sorry, I don't know conferences. I'm sorry I'm not a diehard uh, basketball fan like that. But, I mean, of their... Of their only seven losses, I mean, most notably Houston, BYU, and Baylor. So, some of this there, some of this there. But as for South Dakota State, you know, not too bad. They got Zeke Mayo, who averages 18.8 points per game, and William Kyle, who averages 13.1 points per game. They should be fun. They'll go as far as their uh, star, Zeke Mayo, can take them. He's a, he averages 38 minutes per game. So, I mean, this guy is playing almost the whole league. Um, the Summit League, the Jackrabbits League, they don't grab a lot of their misses and don't get to the line off and likely making it difficult for them to pull off an upset, which I agree with you, ESPN. Iowa State goes to the round of 32. We'll stick with the division before we go to um, the next one in reference to the uh, sending all these teams to the Sweet 16. Going back up, you got UConn and FIU, a one seed and an eight seed, and this would be a rematch. This would be a rematch. And fun fact, um, number one seeds have won 60 of 77 meetings with number eight seeds, almost a 78% uh, win rate. However, for the first time ever, an eight seed has beaten a one seed in each of the past three years. That statistic is also true for two seeds beating 15 I mean 15 seeds beating two seeds so don't be surprised when I sprinkle in a little one over an eight and a little bit of a uh, 15 over a two but when I look around the bracket when I look around the bracket and I kind of look at some other one seeds versus eight seeds this one will be close but I just don't see UConn dropping this game again to FAU I just don't Tristan Newton Cam Spencer too talented on UConn it's a reason they're the number one team I mean you know, FAU, they, they may be good. They may be talented. But um, there was Cinderella team last year, and history can only repeat itself so much in this tournament. So give me UConn to advance to the Sweet 16, sending one of our uh, four one seeds to the Sweet 16. Then we have San Diego State and Auburn. And, you know, as much as I want to see that San Diego State, UConn going up against each other, Auburn is just so good. They're just so good. I like something about them. And when I look... At the top two players in San Diego State, you have Jadon Ladee, who averages 21.1 points per game. Then the second is Reese Waters with 10.1 points per game. That is a that is a 11-point discrepancy from your top star to your next top star. You go to Auburn, Johnny Broom averages 16.2, Jalen Williams 12.4. That's an under-four discrepancy there. I think Auburn is a much more better team collectively. Also, number four seeds have won 57.3% uh, of their matchups when number five, and since 2011, they've won 69.2%. So the stats are with Auburn for this one. Plus, they average... Almost nine more points per game 
and you'll give up just under one more than them. They've played more teams. They've won more conference games. Give me Auburn to take UConn on in the Sweet 16. BYU and Illinois. This is where things get interesting. This is where I get a little troubled with things because, like I said, I kind of rock with this BYU team, but I really like this Illinois team. You got Taryn Shannon averaging 23 points per game on Illinois, and Marcus Domascus averaging 16. This Illinois team is absolute killers, and Jackson Robinson, the top player for BYU, does come off the bench. Look, I know some people are going to want to pick this six over the three, but when it does come to 3v6 seeds, I mean, thank goodness, number three seeds have won 22 of 27 meetings from 1985 to 2007, 81.5%, okay? Since 2000, oh no, that was actually back in, from 1985 to 2007, they won 51%, but since 2008, number three seeds have only dropped five games to number six seeds, and by the way, Illinois just won the Big Ten, crazy game against Wisconsin, loved watching that. Give me Illinois to advance to Sweet 16. And here we go. I have my one, my four, my three. I don't see it being one, four, three, two. Okay, as much as I love Iowa State, as impressive as they were beating Houston, there's just something about this Drake team. They also have one more win and one less loss than Iowa State. Tucker DeVise, I feel like, can match up well against Keyshawn Gilbert. Um, Aiton White can match up against Tamin Lipsy. Those are some of their top players. And I mean, I don't know. Number two seeds are 10 and 1 against number 10 seeds. Last defeat did come when Miami knocked off Auburn, you know? So I can't ride with all the high statistics. There's something about this Drake team. I like it. Give me Drake in the Sweet 16. So there we go. You got UConn and Auburn and Illinois and Drake in the Sweet 16. Plus, it's Drake. I just watched Drake Bell on his little documentary talking about everything that went down. You know I'm going to ride with him. Let's move to the West Division. Of course, you have your West, your Midwest, your South and your East. Our East, we got UConn, Auburn, Illinois, and Drake in our Sweet 16. Let's check out the West before we keep moving on. North Carolina and Wagner. Let me just make it simple for you. I watched Wagner play the other night. They are not winning this game. 17 and 15 on the year. UNC went 27 and 7. North Carolina is so talented. RJ Davis, 21.4 points. Armando Bacchett averaging 14.1 and 10.2 rebounds. Dude's an absolute menace. Going to be an easy win for UConn. If, if there, actually, you know what? If there's ever going to be an upset, Wagner getting it done would be a huge upset. But of all the realistic 16 seeds, Longwood against Houston or Grambling against Purdue could be some, but I don't see it happening here. Mississippi State, Michigan State. This is where we start getting into matchups where I there's just my head spins, my head turns, but I've picked so many different ones. I like to kind of be certain on what I'm going to go with. So from all I've been seeing, you got this guy named Josh Hubbard on Mississippi State. He was an absolute stud in the ESPN Top 100 prospects for the draft. Josh Hubbard averaging 17.1 points per game. But there's just something about this Michigan State team which is experienced in tournament play. Tom Izzo is such a good head coach. Um, Number nine seeds have also won 13 of 20 meetings with number eight seeds in the past five tournaments. And as I kind of look on my bracket, I already gave FAU an eight seed the nod. As I look at some of the other eight versus nines, I'm pretty certain on a couple of others. I think eight and nine split this year, and I think Michigan State pulls off an upset. And I've seen people saying Mississippi State's a sweet 16 team, but I just got some about these Spartans that get it done. Give me Michigan State in a close battle. Next up, who oh man, they got some fire 12 seeds in this tournament. Number five seeded St. Mary's and number 12 seeded GCU Grand Canyon University. I actually knew two kids who actually used to go there. One of them's going to be my roommate next year. GCU went 29-4 and four on the year, winning their conference. Absolute studs, but the um, issue is they didn't really play. That many other good um, good people. And by the way, they have a star player, Tyrion Grant Foster, who averages almost 20 points per game, six rebounds. But the thing is, St. Mary's is a team. They are a team as much as it comes. And GCU just gives me the vibe. They're playing bums. They're kind of, you know, your one star player takes over. And as for St. Mary's, they have lost one game since Christmas, and that came against Gonzaga. Okay, they're operated under Randy Bennett, who plays a bottom 10 pace and sucks the life out of opponents on defense. GCU thrives themselves on that fastball. And, you know, I'm going to pick some other 5v12 matchups. And GCU just has not played, has not played anyone near, near the level of them. Let's look at GCU's notable wins, okay? 
Notable games, actually. I mean, San Diego State, there you go. They beat them. South Carolina lost. Okay, Liberty won, not even a tournament. Seattle U Redhawks, who even is that? St. Mary's is a team game, and they're just a team that no one's going to expect to go. You know, they're not a fun name like uh, Duquesne or New Mexico, but give me St. Mary's. But if GCU does pull off an upset, I will not be surprised. I honestly won't be surprised at too many upsets in this tournament. There may be a couple that catch me off guard, but certainly not this one. Next up, Alabama Charleston, and oh man, here we go. The four versus thirteen seed. Alabama went twenty-one and eleven on the year, but the Charleston Cougars went twenty-seven and seven. Super impressive, Charleston. Um, they actually played uh, Florida Atlantic this year. It's probably their most notable game they played. They were able to win their conference, or maybe almost win their conference, but number four seeds have won 78.9% of meetings, so number 13 seeds, at least one number 13 seed has beaten a number four seed in 27 of 38 tournaments. I really want to ride with Charleston in this one. I won't lie to you guys, there's just something about this Charleston team, but I do not see multiple 4v13 upsets happening in this tournament, and I have another one in mind that I'm going to bring up, so I think we are going to leave Alabama advancing, not going to have them go far, not going to have this Alabama team go far, I mean, even though they got Mark Spears, who's an absolute dime, absolute dime, averaging 21.1 points, I, I just think they, they do struggle. They do struggle with certain things at times, um, especially turnovers. They struggle to force turnovers, and they give up turnovers. And they only have won two games of their last six heading into the tournament. So they really don't have any positive momentum compared to a Charleston team who has momentum. Moving on, Clemson number six, New Mexico number 11, and everyone's sleeping on this Clemson team for some reason. I feel like everyone has New Mexico advancing, but there has to be for a reason. I mean, I, there just has to be a reason Clemson's being slept on. After an 11-1 and start to the season, the streaky team have now lost three of four to finish 10-10 and over the last 20 games. When Joseph Garrard III is draining them from three, there's the star point guard, the Tigers can get on a roll. If not, every game seems to be a struggle to overcome extended cold streaks. Yikes. They have played a tough schedule, though. Wake Forest, Pittsburgh, North Carolina, Virginia, Duke, TCU, Alabama. So tough games, but New Mexico. New Mexico, they've beaten San Diego, beaten Utah State, um, beaten Colorado State. All those teams are in the tournament. If the Lobos enter, um, actually the Lobos do enter the big dance on a hot streak, fresh off a surprise Mountain West title. They boast one of the best offenses in college basketball, ranking among the top teams in points per game, and are great at taking care of the ball and forcing turnovers. Yeah, New Mexico could be a potential Cinderella team in this tournament, but we'll need to keep up with their opponents to have a shot at a deep run. They do average more points per game, give up less points per game. Um, but so, yeah, you know what? I like the 6 for 11 seeds in this one. I already didn't give it to Duquesne, so give me New Mexico over Clemson. I like that upset. There's just something about it. New Mexico just kind of has the ring, kind of has the ring like, hey, you know what? We're going to make a little run this tournament. Next up are 3 and 14. Here is where... Um, a huge upset could occur. But number three, Baylor. Number 14, Colgate. I won't lie. I, I'm just brutally sleeping on Colgate. I don't think I've picked them in hardly any of my brackets. I've kind of just been clicking Baylor as I go through. And it's kind of because Colgate doesn't really have a win over anyone notable. Um, I mean, there's just not much to say. They're in for their fifth straight season. And they haven't won yet. They haven't won yet. They've pushed the two-seed and three-seed to the brink in past years. Um, and they live by two mottos, shoot a lot of threes, and force the opponent to work hard to get open shots. But um, fewer possessions and three-point variance could be the recipe for another close game. But they take on Baylor, led by Jacoby Walter, who's one on ESPN's top 100 prospects, averaging 14.2 points per game. This team played Duke close, beat BYU, beat Iowa State, played Kansas close, played Houston close. I mean, this is a tough Baylor team. They've always been a contender under Scott Drew, their head coach. But this year is one of the best offenses in the country. They rank among the top teams in adjusted offense efficiency and effective field goal percentage. Yeah, their their offensive amount of momentum does continue. Plus, number four, three seeds have won 85.85% yeah, of meetings with number 14 seeds. And since 2017, three seeds have only ever lost once. They've only ever lost once. This team does seem to be far better. So if there's ever going to be an upset, I don't see coming. It's this one. Give me Baylor over Colgate. But if the toothpaste team wants to do it, they can get it. Anyone get that? Colgate, Baylor, yeah. 
Next up are seven and ten, the Dayton Dayton. What are they? Dayton Flyers? Dayton Dayton Flyers. I did know their mascot. And the Nevada. Gosh, I don't even know what Nevada is. It looks like a Wildcat. Is it the Nevada Wildcats? Sometimes I don't know their mascot. The Wolf Pack. They're wolves. Ooh. Yes, Dayton and Nevada, another matchup where I've just been kind of going Nevada every time I see their name. The Wolfpack are a well-rounded team ranking among the top half of teams in country in offense and defense efficiency. However, Nevada must bring its A game to the court to consistently win games. They are efficient three-point shooters, but they have gotten lucky. If they can control the rebounding advantage, they can likely come away victorious. As for Dayton, there's not much to say. They hold a win over VCU. That's all I got for them, but they're just 5-4 and four in their last nine games and by the way number seven seeds have only won 60 percent of meetings with number 10 seeds in the past two years seven seeds have won six of eight meetings so i guess that's good for them actually but i like nevada i like nevada and new mexico both in this bracket that would bring me up to three upsets in total for uh, for my bracket so let's keep it rolling as we reach one where i just i'm, I'm troubled by this gentlemen i'm troubled by this number two seeded arizona takes on number 15 seeded Long Beach State, and something about Long Beach State just screams upset to me. It really does. We're in Arizona. This is supposed to be their year to make it. They have a stud in Caleb Love who'll probably go to the NBA, 18.1 points per game. Also have Omar Malo on that team who's averaging a double-double in points and rebounds. But Long Beach State, I mean, there's just something hilarious about this team um, as they were going to fire their head coach, and they actually informed him you're going to be let go after the end of the season. And after that, they just wouldn't stop winning. They ended up winning the Big West Championship, winning their conference. Their senior, Marcus Tashono, has led the team in scoring. Um, they play a fast pace on offense and manage to slow opponents down. This could really lead to an upset. But fun, here's the fun fact I love. A 15th seed has won a first-round game in each of the past three tournaments. Why stop now? Honestly, why stop now? This Arizona team... I mean, they hold wins over Duke, over Wisconsin. They've played Purdue close. Wins over Alabama. Wins over Utah. I mean, they're well-balanced. Of course, they got Caleb Love. They rank in the top 15 nationally. Um, recent losses to USC and Oregon leave the Wildcats looking for momentum entering the dance, but they have the talent to make a deep run. And I was really torn. Do I pick Do I pick St. Peter's over Tennessee as my 15 over 2, or do I pick Long Beach State to beat Arizona? I mean, no one will see that coming, will they? No one will see that coming, and sometimes you got to be risky, but I just I don't know. I just can't do it, guys. Arizona over Long Beach State, it's just it's too tough. In some of my brackets, I've given it to Long Beach State, but for this one, the official podcast one, I mean, if we're in Arizona. Arizona's not dropping a 2-15 to matchup, um, but hell, anything could happen. Anything could, anything, anything could happen. It's going on in Salt Lake City, too, which I believe is closer to Arizona than it is to California. Then again, I'm not too good with math. So Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, Baylor, St. Mary's, Alabama, and North Carolina and Michigan State make up my round of 32 teams. As we head to the top, of course, there hasn't really been a tournament where all number one seeds have made the Sweet 16. But do I spell an upset with UNC and Michigan State? That is the question I arise. As much as I think Michigan State can get past number eight Mississippi State. I don't exactly know if they can get past this UNC team. I really don't. And by the way, number one seeds are 71 and six against number nine seeds. The only win in the past nine tournaments came in 2018 when number nine ranked Florida State beat number one Xavier. Don't see it happening here. Send North Carolina to the sweet 16. Next up, the 4-5, and five, Alabama and St. Mary's. This could be a close one. This one's going to be coming down to the wire. Number four seeds, as we mentioned, are 47-35 and 35 against number five seeds, but have won 18 of 26 meetings since 2011. I just, I don't know how good this Alabama team is. I know how good Mark, Mark Spears is. He's talented. But some about the St. Mary's team, they're well-rounded, well-balanced. I think they can make it to the Sweet 16. Plus, there's always that one team where everyone's kind of like, oh, I'm surprised. I guess they're good, but how did they make it this far? I think that's St. Mary's. Give me St. Mary's and UNC in the Sweet 16. Moving to the bottom of it, number three seeded Baylor, number 11 seeded New Mexico. Like I said, New Mexico has all the feelings of a Cinderella squad, of a team to make it far. By the way, number three seeds have won 63% of meetings with number 11 seeds, but are just 13 and 12 since 2010. Something notable, something to keep track of. Plus, I really like this New Mexico team. I really do. They average more points. They give up less points than Baylor. I mean, 
rankings wise, Baylor's at the top, but I don't know. Some about this, some about this Baylor team kind of, kind of drink draws a little ring out of me. But as we look up to um, my freaking predictions in the East, I didn't have. I had one, had one double seed making it. I don't know if I can have another double seed, but guess what? We're going to do it. Send Nevada with the upset. Eh, actually, does Nevada strike me as a team to pull off the upset? I don't think so. I'm sending Arizona to the Sweet 16 over Nevada, actually, just because I don't think Nevada has the ring of a Sweet 16 team. I hear St. Mary's. Yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Drake. Yeah, Illinois, yeah, you, Auburn, yeah, UConn, yeah, even Drake's a bit foreign to me, but I just don't see, you know, Nevada making it. As for New Mexico and Baylor, you know, I'd love to see the two and three, but there's just something about this. I just don't see all my three seeds making it. Give me New Mexico over Baylor, New Mexico versus Arizona, a little southern or southwestern United States matchup going down. I love it, and that's right. We have eight teams from our west and east already in the Sweet 16. And as we continue to cook through this bracket, I mean, it's hard to make a bracket. It takes time. We head to the South, Houston and Longwood. I saw a fun statistic that all the big upsets that have happened in the past year, last three years, um, have all had to do with, like, uh, they're making, like, genital jokes, like how um, St. Peter, like Peter, they had an upset. You had fairly dick and son. You even, who was the other one? There's another Another team I can't mind. And so they're saying Longwood was going to be the team to pull off a 16 versus one upset. And don't get me wrong, the Lancers, they're, uh, they could be dangerous, but they haven't played anyone. They haven't played freaking anyone. Their most notable win is over the Winthrop Eagles. The Winthrop Eagles, they are, they dropped 10 out of 12 in the middle of the season before they were able to win the Big South Tournament title. Their best offense has come via second chances. And while the Lancers aren't great from the perimeter, they have shot it better during the past month. But by the way, there's only ever been two teams to lose to a 16 seed while they're the one seed. It happened last year, but I don't think Lightning strikes twice, especially in this case. Give me Houston over Longwood. Next up, Nebraska, Texas A&M, very torn by this matchup. I've heard Texas A&M is a dangerous team, but Nebraska has a guy from Japan named Kisi Tominaga. All right, and that's just so cool, absolutely cool. Texas A&M, I do think, has played tougher opponents in the SEC. They've got actually a win over Kentucky and a win over Tennessee and only lost to Houston by four. This team is tough. This team seems competitive. And as for Nebraska, you know, blowout losses to Wisconsin, blowout losses to Creighton, but blowout wins over Purdue, blowout wins over Ohio State. Oh, it's so tough to tell with both these teams. Like I said, we're splitting our eight and nines as we go through this, and I got a feeling that Texas A&M advances. Put a little, little battle, a little battle of Texas between Houston and Texas A&M. Moving on to my next one, so fun, so pumped for this. I'm like, I'm actually ecstatic. This is gonna be amazing. Number five, Wisconsin. Number twelve, James Madison. The Dukes of James Madison are thirty-one and three. The best the best team in the tournament. Now, I won't lie. They were playing bums. They were playing bums all year. Their most notable games you could find is they were given Michigan State in their opener. They beat Akron, all right? There's just no one. They haven't played anyone notably. Terrence Edwards is their star player, and um, that's just the one thing. That's just the one thing. They're dangerous. They haven't, no one else has gotten more victories than them this season, but you know, it's just, they didn't play anyone good. They didn't play anyone good. And that's really the only thing holding us back from this team. I mean, they averaged 84.4 points per game. Um, one team they did beat was Michigan state 50 and three in their conference. I'll be interested to see how they perform against the team in Wisconsin, who I saw play runner-up in the Big Ten, and they were so, so good. Um, of course, they've actually hold a, they got a win over Purdue in the Big Ten tournament, but losses to Illinois, multiple losses to Purdue, only real notable win is over Marquette. I don't know. I smell a bit of an upset. I smell an upset all day. Give me James Madison. Not a big Wisconsin guy either. Personally, a Wisconsin hater. I hate the Packers. Actually, I'm just a Wisconsin hater because of the Packers, but it happens. Next up, Duke at four, Vermont at 13, and this one. This one smells like an upset to me, guys. I don't know. This Duke team is not as solid as years past. Yeah, Kyle Flipowski and Jeremy Roach are absolute studs, stars of the team, but... I don't know, Vermont got more got more wins than them this year. I mean, my goodness. They have seven players who average 20 minutes for Vermont, and they're making their third consecutive trip to the dance, and they've won 19 of their last 20 games. 
My goodness. Like I said, number four seeds have only, um, actually number 13 seeds have won less, less than 30%, close to 20% of games. Um, you know, they give up less points, but then again, they never played anyone in the top 25. They, uh, they did good in their conference, but it comes down to notable wins. There's just no one. They lost to Colgate, beat Yale by one. I don't see anything that's making me want to pick Vermont. Plus, you know, my cousin's a huge Duke fan. Who doesn't love a little Duke basketball? Give me Duke all day. I'm going to be making a Duke franchise when uh, NCAA basketball finally comes back. This could be a fun one next. Number six seed, Texas Tech. Number 11 seed, NC State. NC State is on the run of a lifetime where they shockingly won the, um, oh my gosh, what what uh, what conference are they in? I wish it listed their conferences on every single one. They won the ACC tournament. Thank you, mind. Um, they were able to knock off all the top dogs. They beat UNC to win it. Honestly, I think they might beat UNC to win it. They actually beat Duke in the tournament, if I'm not mistaken. This team's dangerous, but don't sleep on Texas Tech, man. Do not sleep on Texas Tech. Pop Isaacs is their star player. Dude's an absolute gem. And, I mean, Texas Tech has played Houston, BYU, Baylor, Kansas, Iowa State. I mean, they've played some tough competition. Um, but they are under a first-year head coach in Grant McCaslin. And there's just something about a team who just, you know, when it's their first year in the tournament, I don't really don't really like it. The Raiders also struggle defensively on the glass, and they struggle slowing down opponents. Give me 11 seed North Carolina State with the upset. I love it. You know, they, they're on a run right now. It, it's not stopping until they get done. Next up, number three seed Kentucky, number 14 seed Oakland. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. There is nothing appealing out of this Oakland team. Nothing strikes my eye. But I'll tell you what does strike my eye for Kentucky. Antonio Reeves and Rob Dillingham, dirty duo. They're just, this Kentucky team is fun. They're frisky. They have struggled at times, but I don't know, nothing too much. Oakland, you know, what'd they do this season? Oh, they lost to Iowa State. Oh, they lost to Illinois. Oh, they lost to Drake. Oh, they lost to Dayton. Oh, they lost to Michigan State. They have just, they challenged themselves in the non-conference. It started them off 6-8, and eight, but they won 17 of their last 20. They were able to uh, win the Horizon League? Um, I don't even know, but I'm not really feeling Oakland. That'd be another upset I would not see coming. So if you want to see upsets that you don't see coming, Oakland over Kentucky. Yeah, give me the Wildcats. Next up, Florida will play the winner of Boise State and uh, Colorado, not Colorado State, straight up Colorado, Deion Sanders, Colorado, and as we are recording this, 920 on March 20th, um, checking on the score as we speak, I kind of didn't want to see because I know that there's always at least one first four team that makes it. And I just wasn't really getting that vibe from Colorado State. But, you know, Colorado and Boise State are playing kind of close right now. And I don't necessarily know how good either of those teams are. It doesn't really give me a preview. So since I have to record this now, you know, I couldn't wait till tomorrow and then upload it. Um, we're going to take Florida over Boise State. Oh, should we? Or should we, should, we give them, should we give the winner... To Boise State and Colorado, because one one of the teams is going to make it. I don't know if it's usually the last one or the second last one, but um, you know what? You know what, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give it to them. We're going to give Florida the win over Boise State or Colorado, whoever they play. I just Florida's Florida's got to do it, right. Florida's got to do it. Represent Florida, get it done. Other than that, I don't know much. 15 seed Western Kentucky, two seed Marquette will round out our south side of the bracket. And I was eyeing up this upset kind of for a while that Western Kentucky might be able to pull it off. They got a stud in Don McHenry. We have just 15.2 points. But look, Marquette's a two-seed for a reason. They are so talented. They've beaten Creighton. They've, uh, they had to play UConn a number of times. Never really got close to them. Closest they got was a seven-point loss back in on the 6th of March. But um, like I said, Marquette, not too bad. Western Kentucky didn't really play anyone good. Number two seeds have only ever lost 11 times. And Western Kentucky does not ring me as an upset team, if you feel. Um, Long Beach State does, but not Western Kentucky. Give me Marquette to advance. Then we head back up top of the south. You got Houston, Texas A&M. This one's tricky, guys. This one's tricky because I really like this Houston team. I really like this Houston team. LJ Cryer, Jamal Sheed, two studs. Two stud seniors, but Texas A&M, you know, they got Wade Taylor averaging almost 19 points per game. They're a tough team. When we kind of look at the offensive points per game, Texas A&M gave up 70 points per game every game. Houston only gave up 57 points per game 
Oh my gosh, that's just so impressive. Conference wise, 15 and 3. Texas A&M went 9 and 9. I think coming off a blowout of Longwood, like Houston should, their momentum will be high. I don't think Texas A&M is going to slow them. Send Houston to my Sweet 16. Now we get into a fun one. The Dukes of James Madison versus the Blue Devil Dukes of Straight Up Duke. And the 4 VCs 12 seed here. This is something notable here. Um, since 2014, number 4 seeds have won 10 of 11 meetings with number 12s. The only 12 seed to win in that span was Oregon State, which beat Oklahoma State in the 2021 second round. Which, by, by the way, a fire tournament in 2021 was an amazing year. Tons of upsets. But what do I feel? What do I feel if James Madison gets past Wisconsin like I hope they do? Do I think a Duke team, which has not been the hottest as of late, they're not coming into the tournament with momentum despite having 24 wins. They aren't necessarily the most, you know, this this isn't the best Duke team we've ever seen, you know, and they've been given signs of fatigue. Um, They are a balanced offense. They should be for good for around 80 points per game, but if they ever go cold, they will go cold. And by the way, For a Duke team that puts up 80 points per game, James Madison averages almost 85 points per game. And you know what? We need that one upset. We always need a couple double-sided seeds in the Sweet 16. So send the Dukes of James Madison to the Sweet 16. I absolutely love it. I know this is a favorite favorite pick of everyone, but I just can't help but get behind the bad wagon. And if they end up losing to Wisconsin and my bracket's busted because of it, I won't even be mad. This is just a fun team to look at. Heading into our next one, North Carolina State, Kentucky. This one's easy for me. Kentucky, three over the 11. We already talked about threes and 11s. Number three seeds have won 63% of their meetings with the 11 seeds. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't I send New Mexico? I sent New Mexico. Um, If I sent New Mexico, I can't also send North Carolina State. So give me Rod Billingham and Kentucky. Absolutely studs at three. Heading down to our final one, we just talked about them, Marquette and Florida, the two versus the seven. Since uh, 2015, number two seeds are eight and nine versus number seven seeds. Despite that, two seeds are 60 and 27 overall with a 69% win rate against the seven seeds. Florida averages 85.1 points per game, almost seven more than Marquette. But Marquette does limit opponents to 69 points per game, where Florida gives up almost 79 points per game. I think people are going to sleep on Marquette in this tournament, and Florida does not really strike me as a team, you know, especially if they can get past the playing game to advance. And by the way, whoever wins between Florida and Boise State or Colorado, um, I'm probably going to pick Marquette over them. Plus, we didn't send Iowa State, you know, so I kind of got to send Marquette. You know, I did send Arizona, which I was a little hesitant on, but it is what it is. So we got Marquette, Kentucky, James Madison, and Houston representing the South. Getting down to the Midwest, that's right, the Midwest, where I hail from. Does anyone know that? I hail from the Midwest. I'm from Minnesota. And your number one seed, Purdue, will take on, I'm assuming, the Gram, the Grambling? Was it the Gramblings or whatever? I can't even remember. Or Montana State, whoever won that matchup. Let me actually check right now. I mean, we don't have to be too professional with this one. I'm always curious to see what happened. Yeah, Grambling State got it done. Last time I checked in, they were up. Look, watching that game, Montana State was up big. They lost the lead. Purdue will manhandle them. Yeah, Zach E. Day's going to have a feed day. You're not losing to a Fairleigh Dickinson this time. But this one's fun. Number eight, Utah State, and number nine, TCU. And there's just something about this Utah State team with great Osabar. Averaging 18 points, that really piques my interest. Really does. They're an incredibly efficient two-point range shooter, but they do struggle to defend two-pointers. The Aggies are adept at drawing fouls and are a great rebounding team, but that success hasn't translated to the offensive glass. They play at a slow pace and don't take a ton of three-pointers, but if the Aggies can't maintain their dominance in the paint, they could be tough to beat. As for TCU, led by Emmanuel Miller, who averages almost a 5-5-5 for assists, rebounds, and points. Averages almost 16 for points. Horn Frogs, they're a simple team. They run the floor, crash the boards. They act actually harder than any team in the nation and are great at getting fast break points and second chance points. They're attack teams defensively and force turnovers, but also vulnerable on the interior, allowing plenty of two-pointers and struggling on the defensive glass. Jamie Dixon, the head coach's squad, is among the most experienced in the nation and should not be taken lightly. Unfortunately for them, I saw an Instagram thing where it said pause to see who you have winning March Madness, and I paused and it had Utah State, so I don't think Utah State loses right away. Plus, you just saw right there, they struggled to defend two-pointers. That's Utah State's specialty. Number eight seed, Utah State, to the round of 32.
Next up here is the nation's favorite right here. Number five, Gonzaga, and number 12, McNeese. McNeese is 30 and 3. Gonzaga 25 and 7. Graham Ike and Anton Watson are the stars of Gonzaga. And you got Christian Schumat and Shadaha Wells, stars of McNeese. Um, here's the fun stuff with McNeese. They also have not really played any heaters. Their biggest moment was a win over Michigan. By the way, this Michigan team this year sucks. They also blew out the UAB Blazers, so that's another good win for them. Um, winning the turnover battle is not just a football thing. It's what Will Wade's Cowboys do at McNeese. They're among the nation's best in points off turnovers and also in limiting mistakes offensively. Four of their top five scorers shoot better than 40% from three. It's hard not to notice the 30-3 and three record, but the reason McNeese isn't a better seed is its underwhelming schedule. Cowboys face just one team that made this year's NCAA tournament UAB. So we're about to see how they handle the bright lights. And as for Gonzaga, they are experienced and they played Purdue. They played UConn, playing them both under 10 points in the season. Um, competitive as ever. They actually beat Kentucky. Close loss to St. Mary's. Did beat St. Mary's. Um, this year's Bulldogs, they're not the most surefire NBA prospect loaded team, but they remain an offensive juggernaut behind Mark Few, legendary head coach. Um, the Creighton transfer Ryan Nemhard has had 10 plus assists in three straight games, and their Wyoming transfer Graham uh, has a, Graham Ike is a force inside. And the Zags take care of the ball exceptionally well. Don't let their seed fool you. They're incredibly capable of making a deep run. I've already given um, James Madison, the benefit of the doubt. Sorry, McNeese, I can't pick you too. But here's who I can pick. We're going down Kansas, Kansas, and Sanford, the four and the 13 seed. And I've just been so hesitant to pick a 13 seed this tournament. But Sanford's gone 29 and five, led behind a core, a core, averaging 16 points per game. This team did get blown out by Purdue, but did kind of manhandle a majority of the other lesser teams they played. And they run a style called Buckyball. It's an up-tempo system with frequent substitutions. Think of a hockey game. Ten players average at least 12 minutes per game, named after their head coach, Bucky McMillan. And it works. The Bulldogs average 86 points per game, 10 three-pointers per game, shooting 40% behind the arc, leading the nation. And Sanford also forces turnovers at high rate. They aren't a strong rebounding team and have never won a tournament game, but that almost makes me want to pick them more. As for Kansas, guys, their star player, Kevin McCuller, is out for the tournament, leaving Hunter Dickinson, their star center, who's averaging a double-double alone to lead this Kansas team to enter the big dance. Um, and actually, Hunter Dickinson missed the Big 12 tourney, so thank goodness he can return, but he won't be 100%. They rank mid-pack in adjusted offensive efficiency and effective field goal percentage, but they shine on defense and stifle opponents by consistently contesting shots and securing boards. Kansas's balanced approach could take them far in March, but if its two stars aren't healthy, the Jayhawks may be on upset watch. Yikes, but guess what? Guess what? I think that's going to get hurt of Sanford. Averages 11 more points per game than them. All right, they went better in their conference. They got a dog as their logo, and it's a bulldog. Gonzaga Bulldogs, yeah, give me that Sanford team. Two upset Kansas, a 13 seed over a four seed. It rarely happens, but it's happening on my bracket. I love it. Gonzaga versus Sanford in the round of 32. Four more games in the round of 64. We head to South Carolina versus Oregon. Going down in Pittsburgh, might I add. Hmm, how fun. South Carolina 26 and 7, Oregon 23 and 11. Guess who won the Pac 12? It was Oregon. Oh, yeah. And Folly Dante averaged 16.1 points per game and 8.8 rebounds per game. And Jermaine Cozenard averaged 15.4 points per game off the season. Oregon, fun team. Played Alabama close, played Arizona somewhat close in one game. Um, biggest. Actually, they did get a win over Arizona this year. Good for them. As for South Carolina, um, blowout losses to Alabama, blowout wins over Kentucky, close wins over Tennessee, blowout losses to Auburn. It's been a wild ride for the South Carolina team. Um, they're balanced. They know how to take care of the ball. They got 26 victories, never really had a dry spell with their losses. But their issue is in their lack of efficiency on offense, which uh, could be very bad against a defensive-minded opponent. Opponent. Um, by the way, um, they do only uh, score 72 points per game. Oregon does score more. The, the experience does go to uh, South Carolina, but Oregon coming in with some positive momentum, giving number 11 Oregon over number six South Carolina, which I love. I love that pick. A little upset pick for the boys. Give me Oregon over South Carolina. Plus, I just like Oregon's logo better than South Carolina. I mean, South Carolina's probably going to win the woman's bracket. We can't have that happening in both of them. 
Here's a fun one. Number three seed Cretan. Number 14 seed at Akron. And as much as Akron would be an upset, this Cretan team is just too good. Baylor Sharman and Trey Alexander both averaged just around 18 points. Studs for Cretan. They blew out, um, uh, what's their face? They blew out, um, who did they blow out to win the uh, the tournament? Was it Villanova? Was it Villanova? They they had to win, or didn't they? Did they win their tournament? I have no idea. I know Akron got in with just a buzzer beater, so they barely got in the tournament, which would make it all more legendary if they won. But this Creighton team averages eighty points per game. You know, they're number nine team in the country. Give me Creighton over Akron. Next up, Texas will take on the play-in team of Colorado State. And unfortunately, due to the fact that a one play-in team wins every single year, and I just do not think Boise State or Colorado is going to do it, I have to give the nod to Colorado State. I mean, there's just nothing appealing about this team. They rattled off wins over Creighton and San Diego this season. Mind you, they also lost this season. Um, they were one of the hottest teams on the Mountain West, but um, then they went on a little losing streak. So, um, you know what? I love the 10s over the 7s. How many have I picked this tournament? I've now, I'm have now i going to be picking three 10s seed upsets. I don't know if that happens, but I would rather pick three 10 seed upsets than I would want to pick a, um, how do I say it? Um, not having a play in team win because a play in team, I'm pretty sure wins like just about every year, even though it's not appealing, they still, they still kind of do it. So we'll ride with them. We'll see what happens, but fun times all around. And then we get into number two, Tennessee and number 15, St. Peter's, and this is where the brackets are going to be busted. The St. Peter Peacocks are back in March Madness. And you know what happened last time that they were uh, that they were um, a 15 seed? You know what? They made it to the Elite Eight. They won the MAAC League this year. Um, you know what? This team beat Purdue the year before, uh, two years ago or whatever, but this team is an absolute dog, all right? St. Peter's, they average 14 less points. They average, they give up more points. They haven't faced anyone as good. They're ranked 198th in the country due to BPI. Tennessee's ranked 7th. Okay, all signs point towards Tennessee, except for the fact Tennessee historically does not do well in the tournament. They really don't. I think the most they ever make it is the Sweet 16. And, you know, this team did drop games at Texas A&M and Kentucky. Um, they got stars. They obviously, Dalton Neck is an absolute stub for this team, averaging 21.1 points per game. But I love to point this out. Even Trey Young on Oklahoma lost to Rhode Island or Providence, whatever team it was, in round one. There's been a 15 seed. A 15 seed has won three round one games in a row. Why should we stop at round four? St. Peter's is back. Let the Peacocks fly and send them to take on the Rams of Colorado State. That's right. I love it. We got to give one 15 seed to go. St. Peter's, send them. I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. Send it to them, St. Peter's. Be the first ever 15 seed to win twice. Twice. Make history. Every, Every tournament we make history, so might as well do this one. Alrighty, let's get into it. Purdue and Utah State, and here's where we draw some issues. Here we draw some issues. Do I see every number one seed making it? Do I? Not really. Not really. And Utah State popped up on my feed. And mind you, Zach Eady is an absolute killer. Best player in the league this season. 24.4 points per game, 11.7 rebounds per game, led college basketball. Absolutely amazing. All right. And by the way, by the way, Virginia, when they lost to a 16 seed, they came back and won the next year. Same thing could happen to Purdue, who lost last year. Um, the one thing I do want to point out is that Utah State has a big man to contend with Zach Eady. I can't recall his name, if I'm being honest, but I see him in the promo picture they're showing me. Um, dude towers over everyone else. I can't even see his number, but um, I don't even think that matters. But look, we can't have every single freaking one seed in our fi- in our sweet 16. And by the way, for the first time ever, an eight seed has beaten a one seed in each of the past three years. Purdue has choked the last three years in March Madness. Come on, bring it to me. Utah State to the Sweet 16 over Purdue. The upsets just flowing in, just getting it done. Absolutely love it. Getting me pumped. 
bring it to me. Utah State in the Sweet 16. Next up, number five, Gonzaga. Number 13, Sanford. The Battle of the Bulldogs, if you will. Number five seeds are 17 and 3 versus number 13 seeds and have won 11 of the past 12 meetings. The only win for a 13 seed in that span, Bradley over Pittsburgh back in 2006. So I don't know if Sanford can really get it done. They do average more points per game, but. I think this Gonzaga team, people are really going to sleep on. Sneaky little fifth seed can get in there. I don't know if an 8-13 and 13 seed, has that matchup ever happened, an 8 versus a 13? In the only 8 versus 13 meeting, number 8 Rhode Island defeated number 13 Valparaiso in the 1998 Sweet 16. So I don't really think that's going to happen. Um, give me Gonzaga. You know, I think if Gonzaga is being McNeese, they're going to beat Sanford. And Sanford, they can get past Kansas without their star. But if Gonzaga has all their stars, I'm not seeing it. Gonzaga versus Utah State, my Sweet 16. Next up, Oregon Creighton, an absolute dogfight. This is going to be winner of the Pac-12. Creighton Blue Jays have been hot all year. Um, this one's tough to tough to really go about. Points per game, Creighton has more. They give up less points per game. They did better in the top 25. They did better in basically every stat, and I think they're going to shoot the lights off. And I've picked so many upsets already. Give me Creighton to my sweet 16. And then we get into it. Number 10, Colorado State. Number 15, St. Peter's. Here's a fun little stat for you. Number 10 seeds are 5-0 and versus number 15 seeds with four of the five matchups decided by double Figures. Last time that occurred in 2016 when Syracuse beat Middle Tennessee. I actually remember that. Middle Tennessee beat Michigan State. As much as I love the Peacocks, I don't know if they can fly super far. You know what? A Final Four team making it this far. Colorado State. I would definitely be sleeping on them. Let's send them to the Sweet 16. I'm sorry, St. Peter's, but if you're, I just don't see it happening. The statistics are not in your favor. 5-0 and oh all time. Oh, yikes. So, yeah. Send Colorado State to my Sweet 16, which will be an absolute stunner. All right, the Sweet 16, we go back to the top. UConn and Auburn. Can the number one seed UConn make it to the Elite Eight? Can they do it? I don't know. I don't think they can do it because this Auburn team is just filled with dogs. If they're getting past Yale, if they're getting past San Diego State, I don't see them dropping one to UConn. You got Johnny Brom who can meet Tristan Newton. Okay, Jalen Williams, I don't know if he can really match up with Cam Spencer. We'll see. But if I do send UConn to my Elite Eight, I feel like I just would have to send them to my Final Four, and I'm already sending some other number one seeds. Auburn with the upset. Auburn over UConn to send Auburn to the Elite Eight. Absolutely love it. Next up, Illinois and Drake, the three seed versus the 10 seed. The seed matchup last occurred in 2012. Number three seeds have won nine of 11 meetings with number 10 seeds since they, uh, 1994. Oh, fun stuff. Illinois and Drake. Do I really see Drake going to take on Auburn? Have four seeds and 10 seeds ever occurred even? Number four seeds have won both meetings versus number 10 seeds in 1990 and 1997. Oh, so yeah, odds are not really in the favor. Let's send Illinois. I like Illinois. I like this Illinois team. They could lose. They could lose to Moorhead State. They could lose to BYU. They could lose to Iowa State or Drake. I like them. Let's, let's send Illinois to the to the Elite Eight. I think they're fun. I think they're a fun team. I don't really need a reason with March Madness. Next up, North Carolina, number one seed. St. Mary's, number five seed. Number one seeds are 41-11 and 11 against number five seeds. However, five seeds are a perfect 3-0 and 0 against one seeds in the past two years. Does that continue with St. Mary's and UNC? I don't know. I feel like UNC is that sleeper number one seed this tier, year. And plus, when we just look at the matchup stats for this, I mean, more points per game to Carolina by almost seven. Opponents points per game, you know, St. Mary's is going to not give up as many with only 58, and they did well in their conference, 15-1. and one. But by the way, UNC is playing dogs all year long. Tennessee, Clemson, UConn, Wake Forest, Pittsburgh, it just doesn't stop. This team's talented. Let's send UConn to the, um, not UConn, uh, UNC to the Elite Eight. And by the way, UNC could freaking lose to Wagner. I wouldn't be surprised, but they're in my Elite Eight. Next up, number 11, New Mexico, and number 2, Arizona. And you know what? I love heartbreaks. And by the way, number 2 seeds are 16-3 and three against number 11 seeds, although two of those three losses have come in the past 11 tournaments. Plus, everyone's been wanting to see the return of Caleb Love of Arizona going back to the team he played for for three years in UNC. Arizona has all the better stats, but guess what? We ride with the dogs. We're, we're, we're not really sending any more upsets to the sweet sick, to the Elite Eight. 
So we got to have one double seed in there. That's right. Let's send New Mexico. We're riding with the Cats. We're riding with whatever mascot they got to go to the Elite Eight. I think it's only because people are going to want to see Caleb Love win, plus the Arizona team is in there. So this is going to be a shocker to see for everyone. So let's send New Mexico to the Elite Eight. And then... Let's send our teams to the final four. We got Auburn and Illinois Battle of the Orange and Blue. Four and three seeds since 2013. Number four seeds have won three straight meetings with number three seeds all by 16 points or more. Last year, UConn defeated Gonzaga by 28 points in the Elite Eight. And I think this is where Illinois' run comes. Is it? Will this be where Illinois' run comes to an end? Because I love this Illinois team. A lot of my family's from Illinois. Um, they average more points per game. They do give up less. Auburn played better. We love the upsets. You know what? We have seen some upsets in the past, but in the past 11 years, number four seeds have been this dominant. I'm riding with them. Let's send Auburn to the Sweet 16. I love Auburn as a Final Four. Wow, I sent Auburn to the Final Four. How about that? A fourth-seeded Auburn is in my Final Four. I love it. We're standing by it. The number one North Carolina, number 11 New Mexico. Um, number one seeds are 5-4 and four versus number 11 seeds in 2021. 11 seed UCLA beat number one Michigan in the Elite Eight before losing to number one Gonzaga in the National Semis. Um, UNC and New Mexico both average 81.5 points per game. Their opponents' points per game are separated by 0.3 these two teams are pretty similar, and guess what? We're sending New Mexico to my freak. We're sending New Mexico to my final four. Why? Do I really need a reason? Do I ever need a reason? I like doing things for the first time. A four seed's never took on an 11 seed. Will this bracket be perfect? Hell if I know, but that was a fun little thing to do. Alrighty, we got Auburn and New Mexico in my final four. How goofy. Let's head back to the south. Houston and James Madison in the Sweet Six team. I love James Madison. I really do. But this Houston team is so superior. Number one seeds are 20-0 against 12 seeds. How about that? How about that? Houston over James Madison. Not even close. Not even a competition. Not even a competition. Next up, number two seed Marquette. Number three seed Kentucky. I heard some ramblings that Marquette isn't even that good. I also heard that Kentucky isn't even that good. But when we match up the stars, when we check it out, Kentucky averages 11 more points per game, which is absolutely crazy. This Kentucky team is filled with young studs. Let's send Kentucky to take on Houston. Alrighty, dropping down to the Midwest, Utah State and Gonzaga, the five seed Gonzaga, the eight seed Utah State. Number eight seeds are two and one versus number five seeds. Last time I occurred was in 2004 when number eight Alabama defeated number five Syracuse. Ooh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, so we're going to give the nod to Gonzaga because you know what? It happened 20 years ago. We like to see things that come in set pairs. Gonzaga over Utah State to go to the Elite Eight. Then, number three seed, Creighton, number 10 seed, Colorado State. Don't even know how you wound up your Colorado State. The seed matchup last occurred in 2012. Number three seeds have won 9 of 11 meetings. Um, since 1994, okay, so in 30 years. That has happened. Let's send Creighton. Let's send Creighton. I don't really like Colorado State. Then we get to Houston and Kentucky in the Elite Eight, an absolute heater of a matchup. Since 2007, number one seeds have won 14 of 17 meetings with number three seeds. Last win by a three seed was Texas Tech over Gonzaga. Hmm. Kentucky does average more points per game, but gives up 22 more points per game than Houston does. Houston's a wagon. Houston's the dogs. Let's give it to them. This is Houston's year, I feel. Send them to the Final Four. Then we get number five, Gonzaga. Number three, Creighton. And I mean, this one's just so close. So close. Number three seeds, and of course, two and one versus number five seeds. Last time, number three, UConn defeat number five, Arizona. Gonzaga averages more points per game. Every stat is so, so close. Um, I think when it comes to shooting, I like Creighton's odds. People are going to have Creighton going out early, not me. Let's send Creighton to the final four. And here's our final four, ladies and gentlemen. Number four, Auburn. Number 11, New Mexico. Number one, Houston. And number three, Creighton. Love the matchups. I can't believe these four teams made it. I, sometimes you just, every, this happens to everyone. You make your bracket, and you're like, how did I wind up with all these matchups? But is what is. Let's start off with Auburn and New Mexico. Your four and eleven seeds. Auburn went twenty-seven and seven on the year. New Mexico twenty-six and nine. Holy cow! Um, Auburn averages more points, gives up less points. 
did better. I don't know. I just think a four over an 11 makes more sense. Is this New Mexico going to win the chip? No, but make a little Final Four run? That'd be legendary. Auburn to the national championship. Then, number one seed Houston, number three seeded Creighton. Um, of course, 14 of 17 meetings have gone to number one seeds, and it's just Houston's been such a wagon. All the stats point towards them being the only team that can do it. I think it's like um, you had to be top 12 in the week six poll. Houston was that. You had to be top 40 in offensive efficiency for Ken Palm and top 22 in defensive efficiency. Houston cashed that. Um, no champs have ever won in like their semifinal or something. Uh, just a bunch of random stats. And by gosh darn it, Houston checks all those boxes. Let's send Houston to the national championship. And by the way, Houston was the number one favorite team last year. They, of course, lost. And guess what? We're in Arizona. Why not have two teams from the south and the um, east Get it done. Houston over Auburn in a game 80 to 84 for a 164 total point finale. That's fun. Houston over Auburn is my champion. So Houston, Houston is my champion according to this bracket. Huh. Absolutely fun. Absolutely fun. I am I'm very troubled that I somehow wound up with Houston being my champion over Auburn. Actually, not even that. I stand by Houston. I like their odds this year, but there's just something about um, my, my freaking brackets just having New Mexico sneak their way in. Um, let's rename this bracket to podcast bracket. We cooked for Houston. We stand by Houston. Honestly, we'll ride with the boys. Let's get it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we got. This went way longer than I anticipated. An hour of me making my bracket. And I've already made so many other brackets. But I'll catch you all next time on the Surprise Jet Podcast. This was a surprise episode, might I add to you. Let me know who you guys are all picking for March Madness. We'll be recapping every single game come Monday. That's going to be crazy. That's going to be a hectic episode. Recapping UFC Vegas 89, recapping March Madness. I think I might have to do a whole episode dedicated to recapping March Madness, which is something we do here on the podcast. I know we're working on getting guests. I've also been working on uh, trying to do stuff with movies, trying to rank like my top 10 movies of all time. We got a lot of fun stuff planned here on the podcast. I'll catch you guys next time on the Surprise Jab Podcast.